Hi, I'm David Osrati, and I'm sitting here with Michael Harbaugh. Mm -hmm. um, so Michael is running as an independent for Congress, and yep. for those of you that don't know, that's a very difficult process. It is. You want it to is. tell us a little bit about it? It is. Uh, running as an independent for Congress here in the state of Ohio, you need to get 1% of the vote for governor in the last election as the number of signatures to get on the ballot. For me, my lucky number was 2,800 and I turned in over 4,500 signatures this last year, uh, over 4,000 myself just to get my name on the ballot. Um, it exposes a little bit of the corruption, inherent institutional corruption in the two-party system we live in. If you're a Republican or a Democrat, as David knows, you only need 50 signatures to get on the ballot. For Congress. For now, Congress. Now, for state and city commission, it's 500. That's, so, that's at least a little higher. And, and you turned it into the Board of Elections, which, by the way, has no independence on the on the board. It's either Democrats or Republicans, and it is the cesspool of patronage jobs. That is the ideal job for somebody who's failed multiple times on the ballot, <laughs> like Russ Joseph or Jeff Razabek, and they, they sit there and they lord over these things, and they reject quite a few signatures. You had how many rejected about? Actually, I must say, as somebody who's an outsider, I felt like my, my time with the Board of Elections was actually pretty fair. Um, I was scared going in as an independent, um, thinking, you know, there's Republicans and Democrats on here. They might try to throw out a lot of my signatures. You gave me some good guidance on tips on how to, you know, the things to watch out for. But I actually set a record for the number of signatures I was able to um, get on the ballot. I think I had an over an 83% approval rate. So I turned in 4,500 and about 3,600 uh, got approved. So I was actually very happy. Um, there wasn't any chicanery. I was very, um, you know, they had good, com they had good um, communication with me. So I can't report back any problems or anything but that, like that. That's really rare, getting that many approved. Even me, when I know how to do it and I go and ask for the voter, they tend to reject about 20% of the signatures and I have to go fight with them. And I mm. find it I find it offensive, basically. There, and another thing to add about this is that there was another independent running up in Akron, Cleveland area, and uh, he put on his website, he turned in about four to 5,000, and they rejected about 40% of his. So I can't really comment and speak on how he was doing things, but it is a, typically a very high threshold. 20 to 50% of signatures typically get thrown off. So, which brings me to something that I think is really important. It, there has been a big push by Republicans to have registered voters, and they've disenfranchised a whole bunch of you, and the first thing you should do is go and check to see if your voter registration is still current. And if you haven't voted in a while or you've moved, you might need to re-register. But they're very concerned about registering voters, but they're not concerned at all about registering donors. The people who buy our politicians don't have to be registered, and in fact, it is self-reported. Which brings us to the average cost of running for Congress is about a million dollars. Correct. And, uh, I believe. How much have you collected so far? Oh, around uh, $10,000. $10,000. In okay. 2020, Desiree Timms collected about $2 million and lost by 17 points. I'm not sure how much Teresa Gaspar did. In 2022, I know you were far less than that because you didn't get any any help from the Democratic Party. But typically, yeah, Mike Turner will raise anywhere between one and two million dollars. But it, it, it's a really big cesspool of money and control in politics. And Mike knows 23 billionaires too. None of them live around here, but he gets donations from 23 billionaires. That helps. That helps. So. Um, you're running as an independent. Is that because you have a problem with the Democrats or the Republicans? Both. Okay. Do you Both. want you want to yes. explain where you fit in? in yeah. Between? Because typically it's Libertarian or Green Party or some other Correct. faction. But I've, where do you come in? Uh, I've oh, Hold on. If you're a Green Party, if you're a Libertarian, if you're any of these other parties, you too have to get insane number of signatures it, I, it only uh, pro yes, probably only yeah. the dems and the republicans get away with 50. i think it on. has to do with like if they're on the if they're an officially notif uh, recognized party in the state of ohio yeah, you have but, to yeah. have a candidate for for governor and you have to get at least i think 10 percent of the vote or something like that so I'll, I'll answer that question by starting out by saying like uh typically when there's polling of you know people in congress you know these last several years, the approval rating by just general polls asking Democrats and Republicans is somewhere around like 10, 15 percent. The American public are sick and tired of the gamesmanship, um, the corruption the sold out to corporate America and the rich and the powerful. And I think people 
running as an independent was my idea to actually build back a little trust in our electoral process. If you like me and what I'm running on, you can vote for me. And it's clear as day where my funding comes from. It's muddying the water when the Democratic and Republican Party, they can hide all their donors, super PACs, and they're essentially bought and sold by the rich and powerful. So it was my intention to do the hard path because of the disgust with the corruption in both political parties. Okay, so the big question is, who the hell is Michael Harbaugh and why should we vote for you? Because there's not a whole lot out there about you. Like so truth be told, I was one of those people, and I'm a millennial, so I'm 39 years old. I'm one of those people that avoided social media my entire life. Um, I saw it as a lot of drama. I saw it as something I just, you know, didn't really feel like dealing with. When I decided to run for Congress and make my own website and decide to run, I had to get on social media. And so this is the first time I've ever been on social media sharing my political views or anything. So Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you can find me. But anyways, i um, been a food truck owner. I'm a father of two, a 17-year-old stepson and a five-and-a-half-year-old type 1 diabetic son. And um, yeah, just normal everyday citizen. The reason why I'm running also for office is I, I'm hoping to inspire normal everyday people who didn't go to Harvard or Yale or who have normal working class jobs to run for office. Because right now our country is being ripped away from us. We're being sold out to the rich and the powerful and they're stealing the wealth from the working class of this country. And so my hopes, my you know part of running for office is to encourage other people to Stop being so much in despair, get up off your butts, and you too can run for office. So, And I am fully supportive of that. I believe we should need to have a whole bunch of people running, and I think we really need to move away from this primary process and move to ranked choice voting, which is yes. something that Michael espouses. Um, the city of Riverside tried to just um, install yep. ranked choice voting and got shut down by the Board of Elections. They said it'd be too expensive. Oh, they did? Yeah, wow. but wow. ranked choice voting is a solution where you rank your your choices. So if you say, well, my first choice would be Michael, my second choice would be Amy, my third choice would be Mike, you don't feel like your vote is getting thrown away because if Mike doesn't get enough to have at least 50%, your vote would then roll to Amy. And this is a big part of my campaign. It's one of the top things on my website. I've also uh, coordinated and propped up the Rank Choice Ohio or Rank the Vote Ohio, which is a group here in Ohio that is currently organizing and they are gonna try to get on the ballot in 2025 or 2026 Rank Choice voting for here in Ohio. So that would be, that would do that would move mountains in regards to getting grassroots candidates on the ballot. And the number one thing I hear from people is that, I, you know, I really like, you know, what your ideas are, but I don't want to waste my vote. And, and I understand where people come from from that, and that's one of the biggest hurdles I'm up against. Um, with ranked choice voting, we can fight back against the two corrupt system, and you wouldn't throw away your vote. So I have a nonprofit called modernpolicy.org, and one of the things we push there is ranked choice voting, and we've been a big supporter for a long time. But let's get on to a few other things. His website is Harbaugh for Congress, number four, Congress, not F-O-U-R or F-O-R, harbaughforcongress.com. And I'm going to warn you in advance that it is not easy reading. Somebody decided to do some funky things with some funky fonts that aren't yeah. very legible. Yeah, it's a little artsy. And uh, it's going to be a struggle for you to read through there, but we're going to ask him some questions so you it'd be up to you to go and take a look for yourself and uh, I just want to mention he mentioned Teresa Gasper he mentioned Desiree he mentioned me um, Teresa raised over a million dollars put about a half a million in herself Desiree raised two million wow. before that Sharon Newhart I ran against her she spent about half a million of her own money Wow and you know I raised I think somewhere around 40, 45,000. I spent it efficiently. And I beat Nan Whaley in Greene County and Gary Josephson, who was running in Clark, between him and I, they wouldn't give us a split. We crushed her in Clark. Um, and she had spent $8 million. So, you know, the, candid the best candidates are not getting on the ballot. The people are frustrated. They're not getting good choices. It's not working. So that brings me more to, um, now you can go look at his site and everything, and let's, you've heard a bit about his reasons for running, but it's still pretty normal for people to be able to find a resume somewhere, and I couldn't find a resume. I mean, I know you went to Ohio University. Mm -hmm. I know you were there for um, 
quite a while. Um, you didn't from 2002 to 2009. Six years. Six years. Six years. Well, what, that last year was just taking one class. What did you get a degree in? Political science. Political science. So this has sort of been... Yeah, I've been involved er, in reading the date, grew up reading the Dayton Daily News. Um, you know, we got the subscription. Um, I saved a lot of Dayton Daily News articles that stood out to me in time. Uh, in my office at home, I have 9-11. I have when the Saddam statue was captured. So I've always been um, interested in politics. And, um, you know, it's funny seeing Mike Turner in this old newspaper article that I have from 2003 and they're still on the wrong side of history. Um, I have when they uh, toppled down Saddam Hussein's uh, statue, it had the Dayton Daily News had all sorts of people celebrating, you know, but buried in the bottom right of the front page was one local family isn't really celebrating too much because they lost their son, you know, uh, fighting over there. And I think that was the true story. And then on the inside, you have Mike Turner in there with his quotes supporting 100% George Bush. So uh, that's uh, that goes into a little bit of why I ran for office because one of the biggest... I graduated high school in 2003, um, so I started Ohio University in 2003 in the fall, and you know that was right after 9/11. Um, one of the biggest crimes I feel um, of my adult life has been the redistribution of wealth after 9/11 to the military-industrial complex. So that's from, taken away from high-speed infrastructure, high-speed rail, a modern infrastructure, the best schools, and the best healthcare. From 2000 to 2020. The number of billionaires in this country has gone from around 200 to over 800. And people really don't understand what a billionaire is. I mean, you think about it and everything, but we did a video a couple in the last talking about Monopoly. And as you all know, when one person has all the property and all the money, the game stops. It's over. Monopoly was actually designed as a teaching aid to explain this principle. And it's something we all play, but we don't practice in this country. Um, it started with Bush. It started really with Reagan with some of these tax cuts. But the question is, how is anybody worth $150 billion? And you don't understand that once you get past about $10 million in assets, you don't have to work. You could just live off the interest, even if it's only 3 or 4%. There are people getting richer and richer in this country, and they're getting rich off the work of somebody. So 100%. You know, it's a major problem. And what have they invested in? Like the Koch brothers, they've invested in buying state legislators across the country. And that's why we have all this crazy legislation that comes out of Alec. Now, let's get back to, you know, yes, 2001 was cathartic for a lot of us. Yes, those guys were all Saudis, and we're still best friends with the Saudis, but we attacked Iraq and we attacked Afghanistan. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Halliburton and Dick Cheney, Cheney got really rich off of these wars. Mm -hmm. But let's let's be clear here. Um, you know, Turner, little bitty piece of that. There's 435 people in Congress. Mm -hmm. I think I need to nail Mike Turner down for more concrete things than sure. going along with after we've been attacked. And there's lots of yeah. things to look at. Absolutely. But... The main thing is the man doesn't represent you or I, nor does he care to come and talk to us. So it'd be nice to have anybody there who you can actually call. It's wild, yeah. It's just specifically recently, we could nail Mike Turner down. There was a vote in the House on government spying powers. It was very odd, but it was actually a tie, and there was a tie-breaking. This was voting on an amendment to a recent spying powers bill, and actually the tie-breaking vote, I think, was done by the leader of the House. So literally, one representative could have swayed it one way or the other, and it was in regards to allowing the government to uh, spy on you without a warrant. Now, Mike Turner leaks intelligence when Mike Turner finds it convenient. He did this um, this year, talking about a Russian satellite that had been in space for couple of years saying it has the capacity of hand, holding a nuclear weapon you know it's just Mike Turner was not a Trumper but now is full on board with Trump and of course after Trump loses in the fall Mike will go back to trying to pretend to be more moderate urban progressive city mayor which he never was any of those above and continue on until he gets his dream job working for NATO or some other 
job to, to he sashay can off to. He can retire and, and become a, a lobbyist for the weapons manufacturers, for the arms industry. He can go into retirement very comfortably. Um, he can even run for the Senate. If he wants oh, to, he's, he's got, uh, you know, he's got his PhD now, so he can go. He's you know, been a lifelong a career job. politician. He was in college only in college until like his early 30s, then became mayor of Dayton like two years after that, and then has been in Congress for over 20 right. years. He's a lifelong career politician, has not lived in the real And when world. he did practice law, he practiced for Raj Soin, who is a defense contractor who used his status as an American Indian from India to get preferential contracts on defense spending. And when he sold his building on Linden Avenue, Mike Turner drew up the documents. They sold it to a shell and then another shell. And they kept jacking up the price. And then all of a sudden, nobody has any money. And the city of Riverside forced the taxpayers to pay a couple million dollars to tear the eyesore down. That's the kind of guy Mike Turner is. But that's, that's not really it. People are going to either vote against Turner and vote for you or Amy Cox. So can you tell us what the difference is between you and Amy Cox? Yeah, so we discussed a little bit of the difference between me and Mike Turner. However, some of the differences are kind of the same with Amy Cox. You know, she is a big, uh, has never spoken out on, in regards to foreign policy with Ukraine and Israel. Mike Turner and Amy Cox are on the same side of endless wars in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Um, also, she is not speaking out. Uh, she's also in congruence with Mike Turner and not challenging the status quo we have in this country, not speaking out on any sorts of election reforms, or honestly on many issues. Her and Mike Turner both kind of hide and tiptoe and tap dance around the issues. Um, but more specifically though with me and Amy Cox, I think one of the biggest ones, and I brought with me today is a pledge that I created. It's actually a nationwide pledge and it's called the Ceasefire Coalition Candidate Pledge. Amy Cox has never spoken out for a ceasefire in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. She tiptoed around she it. She tiptoed our, around our, it. She said, she said we slide. need a ceasefire, but then also Israel has a right to defend itself. That's the most mealy-mouthed. She has not spoken about it on her social media or on her website. In December, I contacted her campaign, and I emailed her, and I asked her for an official statement on it, because this was over two months into this, and I said I was going to make some social media content. I wanted her official position on it. She said, refer to my website. On her website, she makes no mention of it. She says that we need, that America needs to repair our relationship with Israel that Donald Trump uh, hurt. I don't even know if that makes any sense. And then in the debate that you had in the Democratic primary, she said a two sides issue. She said, and she said, I need, she said, we need a ceasefire, but also we need Israel has a right to defend itself. And then right after that, she didn't have anything to say about West Bank settlements, illegal settlements, international anything. She said, I need to look into this information a little bit more. And so the biggest difference between me and Amy Cox is you need somebody on day one that uh, knows the issues and understands the issues. Um, four or five months into the largest, most important foreign policy um, decision and uh, event of the year, and you need to look for more information. You don't understand. You're running against the head of the Intelligence Committee, the head of the Intelligence Committee. You should be up to date on foreign policy issues, especially ones that, as of right now, today, we are on the verge of World War III. Iran and its allies are about to attack Israel, this tit-for-tat assassinations, and we need uh, to dramatically scale back um, our Middle East. So I have a very big different foreign policy than Amy Cox and Mike Turner. I'm an anti-interventionist, more of an isolationist. Um, I personally feel that we should have went and fought Hitler in World War II, but since then, the case for intervening around the world in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Venezuela, even with sanctions, has been disastrous. So that's a little bit about, um, okay, you know, so if you'd you, like to touch on anything you else. Call, you, you called Zelensky a war criminal on your site. You said, yes. here's, here's Mike Turner with war criminal Zelensky, well, Zelensky I, is the president of Ukraine. Ukraine was attacked by Russia. Why they, are you calling Zelensky a war criminal? Anybody that facilitates the deaths of hundreds of thousands of your own citizens when you could have found a peaceful solution, Ukraine could have been a part of the European Union. Ukraine could have been a democracy. Ukraine could have upheld the rights of all their citizens and the Russians and everybody in their territory. They chose an aggressive uh, to be aggressively allied with NATO and the United States who wanted to fight a proxy war against Russia. They instigated this war. They chose to go in bed with the United States who historically has fought wars, invaded countries, and then left and made those own countries pick up all the pieces. Look what we did to Vietnam. The allies in South Vietnam, we left them completely 
uh, you know, SOL in Iraq and Afghanistan, all the people that allied with us, what happened to them? We left them. The same thing's going to happen in Ukraine. We're going to leave them. Uh, the money's going to go to the weapons manufacturers, and they're going to be left with a destroyed country with losing 20 or 25 percent of their territory to Russia because they've annexed the eastern Russian part. So I call them a war criminal because you could have um, had peace with Russia. You could have said you're not going to be in an aggressive military um, organization like NATO on Russia's border. You could have been neutral. You, you could have joined oh, the European you, Union. You, so anyway, he, he killed a lot of his own citizens. I, I find that kind of far-fetched myself. I don't look at Zelensky as a war criminal. I look at Putin as a war criminal. I look at Zelensky as leading a, a valiant defense without the real support that he should have had from NATO and the European Union. They came late to the, the picture. Um, I, I find our positions against Putin to be weak. I believe that Donald Trump is Putin's puppet and the truth will eventually come out. But for right now, um, I don't consider Ukraine anywhere close to a war criminal. I mean, the, the, the fact is, wars happen when statesmanship fails. And you can't, are, have, point. You can't have statesmanship with Vladimir Putin because he's become emboldened much because of the success he's had tearing this country apart with his support of Donald Trump, who admits that he likes Putin and he trusts their security people more than our own. Respectfully, it's though, insane. respectfully, though, the intelligence agencies in this country have led us to Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. They are lying no, to us. No, I, I don't. Vietnam was over oil, like everything else. Iraq and Afghanistan were total bullshit and was they lied Dick to us. Cheney. They lied to us. And the same people but are telling us to go fight in Ukraine. And, we're, know. we're not fighting in Ukraine. It's a matter of where we're selling weapons and investing resources. But you, you also say free Palestine on, on your site, and you seem to be pretty supportive of that. Yeah. And as a son of a, a man who went over in 1948 to fight for the War of Independence and what is now Israel, mm -hmm. and as someone who's actually been there, um, I don't think you understand what f the words free Palestine mean. Free Palestine means no more Israel. I disagree. That's what it means. There is no Palestine. Palestine was the territory now that is Israel. And if you're saying free Palestine, you're saying kick the Israelis what out. I'm, what to me free Palestine means, sure, there, I mean, there, there is some people that that's, that's what that means to them. But to me and a lot of other people, it means to live in your land with the freedom and rights of a normal human being. It doesn't mean okay. to kick the Israelis out. It means to live freely and you know, justly. In, in Israel, there are plenty of Arab-speaking Muslims that live and operate full well within the system the way it is. What they don't live without is the fear of rockets and bombs coming across and terrorists every single day. Now, I don't agree with Netanyahu's, you know, allowing settlers to go out and build stuff. And I actually slept in West Jerusalem, literally a football field apart from the DMZ, in a bomb shelter. Because every Israeli house built since 1991, the first room they build, is the bomb shelter, and then they build the house around that, it. That's terrible. Yeah, but that's the standard of what goes on in Israel. That's and, what, yeah. and in the attacks last October, the killing of 1,200 Israelis is as if the 9-11 terrorists had killed 50,000 Americans, proportion to population. That was a huge massacre and a failing of the Israeli Defense Force. Yeah, and policy. I'm going to say the investment that Hamas had made in tunnels instead of into peaceful endeavors and taking care of things is also embarrassing. And to sit there and say that Israel doesn't have a right to defend itself when there are Muslim countries all around who say they don't want Israel to be there, who will not accept the terrorists from Hamas 
and from the PLO and other Hezbollah won't accept them into their populations, we've got a problem. And mm -hmm. I don't think that saying we're not going to support Israel, who has been a staunch ally, which is the one place in this world where hopefully Jews can go and not be persecuted or be have to deal with anti-Semitism, which still exists in this country today. So I have a severe problem with your position when you say free Palestine. Sure. And I, I, Amy has said s similar things in the past. And I can guarantee you that Mike Turner will con ten continue to support Israel because it's a defense, Amy, Amy Cox defense and Mike, industry. Amy Cox and Mike Turner are on the same page when it comes to supporting uh, Netanyahu. Yeah. Okay. So, and, so the, and so, yeah, there's a lot to touch on there. Um, free Palestine doesn't mean get rid of the Israelis. Okay. okay. It doesn't. It le means to live in a free, in a land, you know, where you have the same rights as everybody else. Okay. Um, David, these people are living under military occupation. It is, there is, you are. All of Israel, you can't go more than 150 feet mm -hmm. without seeing somebody standing there with a, a loaded assault rifle. To me, the Israeli government is, is the fault for that because of their maximalist positions. They have created, they have created a society. You, every road has little detours where they check for bombs, David. where they have to yeah. look at this because it is this. Situ the, the way the, the country lives. It's as if they have to worry about a school shooting every single Their day. Their government is to blame for that. I, Their government is I'm going to disagree. Let me, let, me, let, let, me, let me expound on a few things okay. here. If Israel had you know, not been the main force in the way for either a one-state or a two-state solution for the last 75 years, you wouldn't have had October 7th. If they didn't create the biggest, largest open-air prison as their formal policy of dealing with Palestinian people, you wouldn't have had October 7th. Look, the reality is, is that Israel has not been able to get along with any of its neighbors for 75 years. And here's an important point I'd like to make. I am not for wiping Israel off the map. I think that there's too, there's too much history, and I think that Israel deserves to stay there where we're at. Um, just the same way the United States deserves to say we're at, we don't need to leave because we colonize the Native Americans. I think the ultimate plan to peace is a one-state solution there where Palestinians and Israelis live in one state with equal rights under the law, equal protections, equal everything. That, that is called Israel because there are Palestinians Yeah, but not the all Knesset. of the land, not all the land. Well. And so, well, anyway. I, I find, I find it on interesting second. on your website, hold though. Hold on, David. I got sure. there's, there's a lot to respond to here, too. Okay. So something with, um, you know, in 19, look, there's a big problem with Israel and why they've been attacked so many times. Um, not a lot of people know this, but in 1948, when the state of Israel was created in the United Nations, it was a very undemocratic and problematic um, way that they created. Um, after World War II in 1945, the United Nations said that every single people in the world have a right to self-determination. It means that people in these colonies everywhere have a right to elect their own governments. In 1948, when we created Israel, no Palestinian was, um, you know, in, uh, was a part of that process, and no regional governments were a part of that process. In the United Nations, during the, the schematics of coming up with the state of Israel and the negotiations on where the land and the boundaries were going to be, it was only Israeli Jews and then the United Nations and the Western allies that created this. The Palestinians were not a part of it. The regional governments were not a part of it. So that's a major problem. The war, you know, I'm just the saying. war didn't end in '48. It no, no, I know. For it's, it started. Years. It started. Well, I'm just saying. And so you wonder why problems started right off the bat is because you imposed from the outside people of a different skin color and of a different religion coming in and setting up in your land. I think there was only five or ten percent of the pop local population at the time was Jewish. And so, and then you gave them two thirds of the land. I'm just saying there's some unfair things. And then lastly, the unfair thing is too, when the vote happened, when all the countries, you know, cast their vote to create it, there was all sorts of uh, manipulation and bribing going on behind the scenes where the United States was threatening these countries to withholding foreign aid to get them to vote for the creation of Israel. So given those problems, inherent problems from the very get go, you can see why um, and, and lastly, President Truman had a very famous uh, general at the time. He said, President Truman, if you agree and go along with this, you're going to see war in this part of the, of, the re of the world for the next 100 years. Here we are 75 years later. 
Israel gets to benefit from all the, the, the benefits of being a state. They have been the number one uh, source of getting in the way of a one or two state solution this last 75 years. So, and, and we can continue on from this. We don't have to keep on this. Um, I will say is that the Israeli government should have been doing more to do a one or two state solution and October 7th wouldn't have happened. And also too, the Palestinians have a right to self-defense the same way the Americans do, the Palestinians have a right to self-defense. So if you're militarily occupied, you have a right to strike out against your mil being. If, if, well, if Russia or China have, came here, here you have and the, occupied us, we, the Americans would do the exact same to them. We would slaughter them. Here, here you have his positions, and I don't have to agree with him or convince him. But you're a guy who's also sitting there saying that you support the creation of an independent Hawaiian state, mm -hmm. land reparation and compensation to Native Hawaiians for land seized, I don't hear the Hawaiians screaming bloody murder. It's um, a very for, little known issue outside okay. of Hawaii. It's but this a very is something long. on your campaign site. Yeah. I don't hear you talking about. I'm not leading with it. Puerto Rico or Virgin Islands or this, the, the, the people in the state of D, of Washington, D.C. who have no mm -hmm. representation. I don't hear you talking to solve those I problems. I am welcome, welcome to okay. negotiate all that stuff. Um, I'm just saying there needs to be some fair, look, there's poisoning going on in Hawaii. Um, there, look, it was an illegal coup in 1890. We took the Hawaiians' land. It was strong arm stuff. I'm saying that there just needs to be some form of, you know, giving them back a little of what was okay, taken so from them by force. As long as we're talking about cultures and everything else, what's what's your solution to immigration? Since immigration. That's, that's something that a this, lot of people. This seem is to be an issue on. I've, I've, I've kind of switched a little bit on. Um, you know, it's. It's a, first off, I think it's a manufactured issue. Um, the Republicans and the Democrats have been not able to fix immigration for decades, okay? I think it's a huge cudgel issue on the right to not fix it so they can continue to get people on the right to vote for them. Um, corporate America runs our two systems of government, or our two political parties. They could have a system where it's not beneficial for people to come to the country illegally and then work. Right now, it is more beneficial for people to come here illegally, stay outside the system, get benefits and stuff like that, and rather than you know pay the high cost of getting into society. So personally, I do not believe in a wall. However, I think you know, to most normal everyday people, when you hear about millions and millions and millions of people coming across the border unchecked, they could have any criminal history, they could, just the whole idea of this wild west of a border, I think is common sense. So there needs to be, and there needs to be more judges down there to, to go through their cases quicker. And we need to, you know, process these people in an orderly fashion and not make it beneficial for corporations and for people to employ people and to keep this system going. So, like, um, oh yeah. 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 Locally. Yeah, so I'm a full proponent. I actually kind of want my country back in regards to this country being a melting pot. I take great pride in this country being a melting pot, um, being a beacon of liberty in the world where anybody can come, you know, and, you know, have access and, you know, the old world, you know, was dramatically different than this new world here in the United States. So I still believe in the melting pot. Everyone has a chance. So I am pro-immigration um, and pro, you know, uh, people I'm, coming in. I'm but, glad you say that because I'm a first generation American. Yeah. So. I think you benefit and it's what makes the United States the United States. All religions, all ways of life, you know, that's the, what's... A so you talked world. about, briefly, you mentioned, you know, people coming across the border with um, criminal records, criminal backgrounds. Um, you yourself have a bit of a criminal background, mm -hmm. so do you want to, I mean, as Long a journalist, time, I yeah. have to, to no ask worries. these questions. No worries, so. and we did cover this too in some text messages a month yeah. or two or anything like that. Yeah, no worries, I am a lifelong marijuana smoker. So 18 to 24, I was arrested a few times for simple marijuana uh, possession and distribution. If you have over a certain amount, then you get distribution. So I'm a lifelong nonviolent uh, recreational drug user. And those were, and, and so I have two DUIs and then some marijuana charges, you know, 18 to 24 when I was in college. And then there was also uh, some cocaine in there too when I was in college. And there was a so. disorderly conduct as well. Was some, that part of? Sometimes they, they take, charges and downgrade them to a disorderly conduct. So have you been convicted of a felony ever? No, I was charged with a felony at the very end of college at The Ohio University for drug possession, nonviolent drug possession. Um, they seized my car, they seized my money, I got pulled over for a DUI and I went through a couple years of probation and I did my time. I completed probation, passed all drug tests, and um, that was the treatment in lieu of conviction. And I was actually one of the first years that it was implemented out there in Athens County. And that was a great boost to me because, you know, to have my, to start out after college with a felony or going to jail, you know, 
that just ruins so many people's lives here in the United States. It touches on the war on drugs, which is a big part of my beliefs. I feel that we need to legalize and regulate drugs like they do in Switzerland um, to get a hold of our drug problem. Currently, right now, we have 110,000 people a year dying due to drug overdose. To me, that issue is more important than abortion. To me, that issue and people dying due to lack of health care and drug overdose, overdoses is a lot more important than a lot of other issues like abortion that suck up all the people's political capital. Let's be clear. What's your position on abortion? Pro-choice. 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 Okay. Yep. So, all right. yeah, I feel the drug. Look, the Sw- last thing I'll say to people is like in Switzerland, they legalized heroin in the 90s because they had addicts passing out and dying in this park in Switzerland. They legalized it. And they gave addicts, um, you're able to come to, a, you're able to, come to a, a clinic, and underneath supervision of medical staff, you're able to get clean, regulated heroin, inject on site, then you get job placement, uh, you get counseling, job placement, and mental health services. And what, they've sh- and what happened is, is, after five years in the country, they did a referendum in the country, and a lot of the police unions and the conservative people, they came out and overwhelmingly supported this way. It cleaned up the streets. It's they, not just Switzerland, either. There's of course, Switzerland and Portugal, Portugal, but Switzerland's like leading the way. And uh, they found that like over, they got about 80 or 90% of the people off heroin, got them switched to methadone, and that a few of the lifelong addicts, about 8% of them, could not get off the heroin and they were still on it but anyway they cleaned up the gutters they cleaned up their society i mean just imagine folks if we could get we the spend, people we off spend the streets a lot more money incarcerating people yes and, and it's not effective down instead of actually providing health care and taking care of this because most addiction is a mental health issue more than it is anything over else. a million people have died yeah. of drug overdose i think in the last 20 years uh since in 2019 it was 70,000. now we're up to 110,000. i'm just saying it's astronomical how many people are dying and the children and the, and the families i know people in the oregon district you know that have passed away they're just recreational drug users they got some fentanyl laced and some cocaine and they're dead yeah that's what it's happened. awful it's now, awful let's you've had two duis yeah do you still drive drunk huh do you no. still drive drunk? Well, I mean, I, was, I have a bigger problem with people driving drunk sometimes I mean, and injecting themselves. It, it, so I, uh, 0.08, I mean, I might, I'm sure I've been over 0.08 before, but I don't agree with that. I think that the blood alcohol level is a bad way to test people for being drunk. It's, a, it's not subjective at all. Alcohol is a drug with much tolerance involved, and someone like me from an Irish family has a lot of tolerance. Okay. okay? But, uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't just, like the I, I know somebody that drove drunk and killed one person and killed another one later on and they didn't deserve to die either. No, no it's so terrible. Let's uh, let's move on to another question. You say that you are pro-gun. Pro-gun. And yet you also had a thing that you just thought that um, you should have um, a policy that any school that wants Security. it can have... Um, Every school district that wants them, the government should pay for security guards to protect our kids while at school, hospitals, movie theaters, music venues, malls, etc. All protect innocent people in their publicly accessible mm-hmm. places. Schools should be no different. Correct. So, yeah, I didn't say armed teachers. However, I think that is something if school districts want to save some money and do their own training, they should have the freedom to be able to do. I'm just saying, but in general, our kids need to be safe at school. And it's unfortunate where we're at right now, um, but the reality is where we're at right now with all the problems in society and the kids are going back to school, there has to be security there on campus because with all these school shootings, the only thing that stops those school shooters is a security or a police officer. Uh, maybe sometimes they might commit suicide, but what I'm saying is like we need somebody on site, and I think that would be a good investment of government money to keep us safe. And you believe that people should be able to own an AR-15? Yes. Um, I believe that assault weapons bans or anything, or any sort of gun bans right now, if will not solve our institutional problems. Um, I know we feel a little differently on this. I know We feel very, very yes, differently and because I was in the military. Absolutely. I was part of a well-regulated militia. I think you're going to alienate what, too many people. I know I know what an AR-15 can do, and I know why a 223 round was developed, and I refuse to accept the fact that anybody needs anything with that much firepower. So Period. Personally, I believe um, we could solve the problems in society that uh, which is people killing each other without having to ban guns. I think if we did a total gun ban, complete total gun ban, I believe yes, that would decrease um, shootings and pe- the, the statistics. But if we did a total gun ban, and I, I know you're not saying that, but I'm just saying theoretically, if we were to get all the guns off the street, there would be less gun deaths, but you'd alienate 
two thirds of society? And then what are all the trickle down effects from alienating a half of America? When my proposal would be this, don't do any gun bans, but let's invest in all the reasons why people kill each other. So ending the war on drugs, um, invest in a government jobs program to get people off the streets and have them have, get out of poverty. And we all know poverty can breed violence. You know, teach, invest in schools and education. Um, and also too, if we just simply invested in some gun safes, in the government giving, you know, investing in the people. I'm just saying that would I, help. That would I help was, decrease the gun I was the in a well-regulated militia, and our weapons were stored in an armory under guard. And I still believe that if you want to own those kinds of weapons, that's where they belong. Mm -hmm. Period. I, that's me. But mm -hmm. I'm not on the ballot Absolutely. anymore. So you, you get a choice of Michael, yep. Amy, or Mike. There's probably so, a libertarian. I don't no, know. there is not. No, there's not. That's it. Okay. So, um... Again, we really still don't really know what you've done since you graduated from college and for employment. I mean, from what? 20, from, yeah, odd jobs, like restaurant jobs. I worked for my older brother uh, being a college textbook uh, buyer. We would go around to college right. campuses and buy college textbooks and stuff. So it was off the table. Um, restaurant jobs where I was making under $10,000 a year. In 2015, me and my family, we moved up to Michigan. So from 2015 to 2019, me and my family were medical marijuana caregivers. And the way we made a living was selling the weed to dispensaries, which, is a, which was a gray area underneath Michigan law. But it's the way we're able to uh, okay, you know, fulfill our family. Your name's Harbaugh and you're in Michigan. So nobody's That's got right. anything, right? So we did that. And then we came back uh, once I had my, uh, my toddler, uh, who's now five and a half now. We right. came back in 2020 and then started the food truck, uh, which we've been doing now. Um, I'm also the father of a type 1 diabetic child, um, and, and you said you're type 2? I am type, type 2, two but and under so, control with no medications. So. Nice, nice. And so as a father of a type 1 diabetic, um, that has been huge um, you know, in regards to being affected by the medical and Mike, industry. And Mike Turner voted against the Affordable Insulin Act just in case you are a diabetic or you know one or have one in your family, just where his priorities lie. And that Absolutely. was just to bring the price of insulin down to $35. And... The price of insulin is only one part of the, the price equation. People don't realize the cost of the test strips. The, uh, the sensors, the, the pumps, sensors, the pumps, all that all stuff. That, and all they, the they fleece you. They, it is a very expensive disease to live with. We can, uh, so being a part of the type 1 diabetic community here in Dayton, when we checked into the ICU and my son's blood sugar was 750 and he had been lethargic for weeks and we had been taking him in, they said he was constipated, they hadn't pricked his blood yet and he was just not doing any better finally we got him treated in the ICU and it was very tough very uh, stressful when we were in the ICU one of the nurses leaned into us and told us stay poor stay poor because you're not going to be able to afford um, what it does to people and since then her advice has been 100% right you know we own our own business we are not very wealthy at all we thank God just barely qualified in the state of Ohio to be on the state of Ohio's insurance. So we do not pay out of pocket for anything. However, for all the other type one parents that we've met here in Dayton, with, that we know intimately, they are getting crushed and they have insurance. They're getting paid 500, they're paying 500 to a thousand dollars a month out of pocket for the insulin, but the, all the material and stuff, some of it's covered on insurance and some and, of it's not. And eating properly is more mm -hmm. expensive. And something, calories. It, it, it's, it's hard it, and it, that's, and I'm very thankful. I want to say this to people, and this is another reason why I'm running as an independent and I'm disgusted with the, you know, the corruption and the Democratic right. and the Republican Party, is that thank you, government, for decreasing the cost of insulin down to $35. You're the one who created it, though, when you did the Affordable Health Care Act with Barack Obama. They wrote, the lobbyists wrote into that bill that they would be able to take control of the pricing and charge people an arm and leg. People have died since then. And I so have, for I me, have friends who've died, and me and my but, politics is I blame the political parties for allowing that. But, that, but let's be clear, the cost of insulin and every other prescription drug in every other country is cheaper than it is in the United States. Correct. So they make more money off of the United States market than they do the rest of the entire world combined. So yes. we have corruption written into by the lobbyists that control the Democratic and Republican Party written into it. And so thank you for getting the cost of insulin down to 35, but I'm also at the same time not going to thank my oppressors for causing this in the first place. You know, I got one finger for you for doing that. Just saying I'm angry. I'm just saying yeah. it, it's very well, unfair. A lot of people um, should be angry and the reality is in this country if you show up at an emergency room you're going to get treated no matter what mm -hmm. and somebody's going to pay for it but it ain't going to be the insurance companies 
who have been fleecing you for years. We don't need health insurance. We need health care. And if he does get elected to Congress, just saying, he gets a gold-plated health care plan. Yep. As long as Mike Turner has a better health care plan than you or I, we've got a problem. Correct. Now, I'm lucky. I get my care through the VA. And you, if you had care through the VA, you would be thankful as well. Mm -hmm. Government can do some things right. They just, the people with the money don't want you to believe that. They're not going to spend the time telling you all the stories of things that go well. Now, granted, the first thing they want to do on everything is give you a prescription. And that's what they did to me. They gave me metformin without even talking to me about it. And I took two of them too close together, and it scared the living daylights out of me yeah. when my blood sugar dropped. Wow. And I was lucky somebody came who knew what was going on, immediately started stuffing carbs into my face. Wow. And I sat there. I was in a total mental fog and shaking. Freezing cold, Must shaking. Have been Twenty or thirty, your blood sugar. Must I, have I was been real terrified. Low. I didn't. I couldn't do anything. I, I was. I've never been in that situation in my life. And at that point, I vowed I'm going to solve this problem myself. So I basically cut out carbs. I've exercised. I've keto. Eaten, eaten properly and managed it quite well. My A1C is now 5.5. That is the most healthy way yeah. uh, to do it. And so, yeah, another you're touching on another thing. You know, I know a, a diabetic nurse around here who also has a type 1 diabetic daughter, and she prescribes to all of her type 1 diabetic patients. It's either metformin or ozempic. It's one of them. But a lot of doctors are very quick to get on this, get on this. And what it does, what she told me, is that it overstimulates uh, an organ, I, I don't remember exactly what it overstimulates it, and it's kind of like you know putting the metal to the pedal, uh, you know, on your body. And she said over time, it's actually unhealthy. Uh, so what she recommends to people is to get them on insulin if if they can. Um, it's a good stabilizer, you know, in the in the meantime. But and so, but what happened is, you know, the corruption, you know, on one of my policies right here on, on my card right here um, on the back, one of the things I'll fight for it says prosecute big pharma. Um, you know, I'm for Medicare for all. Or universal health care, but we need there needs to be some prosecutions uh, in big pharma for fleecing the American taxpayer. And I think honestly, they need to be charged with negligence or held somehow culpable for the opioid epidemic or for people dying due to jacking up prices and people not being able to afford stuff. So I have a very, I have a very big the chip on my the shoulder. The number one cause for Americans to declare bankruptcy is cancer in this country. Go explain that. How getting sick causes bankruptcy. All right, so. Um, let's just play this out. We have the election. You get maybe 4% of the, the vote, which is what's the generally what happened. Mm -hmm. what's, what's next for Michael Harbaugh? Running again in 2026 and in 2028. Um, this is like a vow that I've been telling people that for too long around here, other than you, David, <laughs> these politicians, they run for office. And then they give themselves a little pat on the back and they go and get a job or they retire and they leave the voters. I'm not going anywhere. I've put in way too much work. I've developed my own website. I've self-taught myself how to run for office as best as I can because there's actually not a lot of information out there. There's really not, um, which is kind of questioning. I gave you a bit of advice. <laughs> you gave me a little bit. You gave me a little bit of advice. But I'm talking about you know right. the campaigning, the social media, all the ins and outs. And so I've done a monumental amount of work myself. So my work does not stop here. And it will continue on into 2025, 2026 to continue organizing. Um, getting up, building up a grassroots support, people's information, and uh, trying to get people out uh, to vote for me. But you know, the goal is the long goal here. Um, I think right now in American politics is you know the trend is away from the Republican and Democratic Party. The the disgust on both sides and the people that aren't political at all, they just see it as just a lot of you know they don't know who to. They're not like us, David. Like where we study the issues and we're journalists and you know we're you know we know what's going on. To them, it's complicated, it's stressful, it seems like all these very important people should handle it, and they tune out. They just go to, they, they deal with their families, they go to work, and so, you know, we need more everyday, normal, everyday people to run for office. That's one of the big things why um, I am running for office, to show you that a food truck owner with no prior political experience can run for office. You just got to work hard and, you know, and get after it. And so that's what I will be doing if I don't win. Hoping to get a lot more in 4%, but it really is a big experiment. I mean, do the American people and the voting electorate care enough? Or do my issues land enough? Like, do they look me up and then right. want to vote? Like, where is? And so actually, there's not a whole lot of data. There was a guy in 2016 around here who was actually an independent. He got 2.5% of the vote. 
but he didn't really run a campaign. He shot like one or two videos outside the base. He was an older, I think, former mayor of Huber Heights or something. He didn't really run a, a new age, you know, I'm on social media, I'm out in the community, I have been at the city commissioner's meetings, I've organized extensively with lots of groups around here, I've been very involved in the community. So it really is a big experiment, you know, to see I where it goes. I hadn't seen you in anything, and I've been pretty involved in the mm -hmm. community. I hadn't seen anything until you started taking up the petitions, so. Well, that's kind of like it all going on simultaneously. When I started doing my petitions, I started, you know, getting involved okay. in the community and stuff. Because Usually running for Congress isn't the first political step people take. It is. It Have actually we had is. Have any questions coming online? Um, it actually, no way of telling. Okay. It actually is. Um, when I looked up, should I, because people told me, why don't you start local? But when I looked up in Congress what these people had done in government, that's their first job. It's their first time they've oh. ever been. They all they had was a millionaire backer, and they were good right. at speaking. They were a lawyer. They they were never. It's their first time in politics. So if they can do it, I can do it. Okay. Um, your voting record, though you were in Michigan before twenty. Green Party. I voted Green Party. I you, voted. You've only got three voting histories in the last 40 in Montgomery County, but you weren't living here. You were living Correct. in Michigan. In so. 2012, I voted for Ron Paul. I wrote in Ron Paul's name. I got into politics with the Ron Paul movement. Okay. Um, well, I try, I would have voted for Barack Obama in 2008 when I was in college, but that was one of the first years they uh, instituted you have to register to vote 30 days beforehand. So I showed up to vote for Barack Obama, you know, with the hope and the dream, and wasn't able to. 2012, I wrote in Ron Paul's name, and then in 2016 and 2020, I was voting Green Party. I'm probably going to vote Green Party again, or maybe for Cornell West, um, because I just feel that while I don't agree with them on you know several things, um, I feel that at least they're the best on anti-war and like for healthcare, and the least amount of corruption. So one of the things you said was freedom of choice in terms of vaccinations. Do you believe that on all vaccinations? What, your individual bodily choice? I mean, yeah. do you believe that kids in school shouldn't have measles, um, smallpox, no, I, I mean, vaccinations? I'm, well, my, my, my son has zero vaccines. Zero vaccines. So that's where I'm at. I think it should be left up to the if parents. Uh, the state shouldn't force them. Same with COVID vaccines. I was very against lockdowns and stuff like that. I believe that the government should only mandate a vaccine if it's a really huge public health risk. Um, I, I don't think COVID met that threshold. I think it was... You didn't see the bodies getting stacked up in, in for, trailers in New York City. I'm just saying like mandated against people's will. You're really going to fracture society. And so if it was like killing 10% of the people, all right, strap them down, inject them. You're not going to... But for COVID, where it was like 0.3% fatality rate, and then amongst those were all people with, you know, comorbidities, the older people. I feel that, um, I don't feel that there was, should have been 25 year old, perfectly healthy people getting a vaccine before the elderly, which is what kind of happened, you know? And so okay. I felt like a lot of elderly people didn't get it. Um, I'm totally for it. Go ahead and get it if you like. Uh, the rhetoric around COVID was absolutely, um, you know, atrocious, uh, dividing people. So I, right. I didn't like the rhetoric. So. This is what I do. I try to make people think. I put together my blog, Azraya.com. I publish pretty frequently. I've been doing it since 2005. I'm involved. I take tips from people. I follow up on them. Sometimes I make videos. I expose things like pepper spraying inmates in restraints in the county jail. I've exposed um, questionable candidate characters on the school board who don't even live in the district. I found a county commissioner's aide sending a sole source contract to his business partner, which Commissioner Lieberman doesn't want to admit. I mean, I do these things because I believe that a well-informed electorate is capable of making better decisions with more information. You haven't seen an article in the paper. You're not going to see a debate. You may or may not get to his website, and I hope he changes the font on that. I think at least Because that font is just almost totally illegible, and I'm a graphic designer, and I, I can read funky fonts, but that thing was yeah, a stress. Yeah, it's a little artsy. But um, I do this because I believe in our community and that smart people can get people to talk about things and understand things without hating each other. I'm going to personally say this as much as I... Um, I'm not a fan of Miss Cox, who does not live in our county, who is put up to run by somebody who she won't disclose. Um, our revolution. Whoever they are, um, yeah. or whatever. I'll talk to her donors. Okay. 
I'm, I'm not happy about voting for Miss Cox, but between her and you, I'm probably going to vote for the establishment candidate. That's okay. just that's me. Yeah. Well, and, thank you for having me on. But I again, I will support your right to run and the right to do what you're doing, and know that when we talk about things, we can usually find some middle ground and find things, and and get ideas instead of this hatred, this rhetoric of hatred. There are things that you said that I very much like, but there's an awful lot that I don't agree with. Like mm -hmm. I am, you know, and that's not going to change me, and I have to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. So I hope any of you who've watched through this have gotten something out of it and enjoyed it. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe so you can see live streams like this when I do them. Um, you can subscribe to my email newsletter on electezrati or on ezrati.com. You can subscribe to get an email every time I post. And um, we're always interested in interviewing other candidates and getting discussions going. And so if, if you're a candidate who's watching this and running in this, in this region wants to sit down and talk, I'll ask you the questions and... You'll give the answers, and it'll be there for the voters to take a look at. So thank you very much, and thank you, Michael. Appreciate you coming in. Absolutely.